Okay, so that means you want to be helping out with this community initiative. Is that right? Okay, I'm excited about that, and I'm very honored. Let me just say one more time how I appreciated the worship experience today from our Sabbath school, Elder Terrence Clark. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for our personal ministry spotlight that you brought surrounding friendship and evangelism. So poignant, so, so relevant for this moment. Thank you. And I can't say enough about our pastor, my pastor, Pastor Chris Leslie. Thank you for great leadership. Now, you better hold on to this man. I'm telling you, hold on to him. Love him because I've got eight conferences and we have a lot of slots in conferences. Okay, so just be happy and hold on to your, hold on to your preacher. What's that lady who said, stand by your man? Oh, I guess, well, stand by your preacher. Stand by him because we love him and we have great plans for, for what God is going to do through him and for him. Thank you, Pastor, for being so gracious and allowing me to share in this ministry with you, not only on this Sabbath, but even as we project forward a bit. I'm so very honored and intrigued that you would think of little old me. I remember when, I remember when you approached me at Oakwood University and you, you boasted about how effervescent and kind I was, but I thought you were just beaming with anticipation for what God was going to do in your life. And it inspired me. And that's the reason I'm here today. So I just want you to know, your pastor is a motivator. He inspires. And he gets things done. So I want to implore you, by the grace of God, I know that you really have not had an opportunity to interface with him on the regular because of the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the corresponding dynamics that preempted our normal worship trend and, uh, and opportunities. But... Here we are, things are opening up again. Uh, permit me for being an unmasked man. I was masked, I was compliant, I brought it, but for the purpose of clarity, I just wanted to make sure that, that I take my mask off. Pastor, do I have your permission? Are you, do you have fear of being contaminated by me standing this close to you? Pastor, look at me, I love you, Pastor. Okay, so Pastor, are you, are you okay with me standing this close to you? Okay, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, I, and uh, elder pastor, I, I just want you to know um, something's wrong with you. Why do you have to get up there and pray that prayer and have the people speaking in tongues and foaming at the mouth? I mean, this gentleman is just full of the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you folk. I've enjoyed my worship experience today. Yolanda, if I lend you my mask, would you please not lose it? Hold on to it for me. Talk to me. Okay, thank you. All righty. So ladies and gentlemen, let me just say, we're about to embark upon something that I consider to be one of the most dynamic. Now, why am I here? God has given me a vision that this church is going to be filled to capacity, not just for an evangelistic series, but because of the efforts that you're going to put forth, God is going to do some outstandingly marvelous things. It has been said that the Church of God is not, Elder Davis, a preservatory for pickled saints. The Church is not a convalescent home for sick soldiers. The Church is not merely a waiting station for those who quest to sprout wings and halos to be launched into glory. But the Church has a job to do. And I maintain that there are three areas that we need to address and touch as church, as leaders of God's protocol to introduce him to the world. And that is, first and foremost, we need to be concerned about an E, three E's. The first E, the first E, edification. We need to learn the word of God. And it's our intention by the grace of God to foster a deeper understanding of the doctrinal position of the Christian church, watch this, and the Seventh-day Adventist church. Going to be preaching some sermons, and I hope you feel good, but they're not going to be feel-good sermons exclusively. But they're going to be designed and targeted to make sure that we learn and understand what the Bible teaches surrounding our direction that we ought embrace as Seventh-day Adventist Christians for these times. There's a second dimension that, that speaks to a base that we ought to touch, a level that we ought to ascend to, another concept that we ought to think through, and that is the issue of evangelization. 
Hear what I'm saying? It's not enough just to be a member of the church. I know times are hard and you want to come and kind of get your worship on and get your spiritual groove on from Sabbath to Sabbath. Nothing wrong with that. Make it happen. Continue to do that. Far be it from me to rebuke you because of that. But I do want to emphasize that we have a responsibility to share Jesus and to replicate, hear me, replicate ourselves. In other words, make more disciples for Jesus. Let people know what we know. Evangelization. Edification is not enough. Evangelization, watch this, is not enough. But there's the third E, and it's called emancipation. Let me tell you what that is. That's just putting, taking what you're doing today, which I enjoyed so much. You all are off the chain. I need to sign you guys up to a label. Y'all, y'all got a label? Okay. Okay, you're basically, um, we, we, need, we need to make sure that we take our worship experience here, and we need to package it. Listen to me. We need to put Reeboks or Converse's or Nikes on it and make it palatable for the surrounding community. What am I trying to say? We need to be concerned about salvation and starvation, about holiness and homelessness, about Christ and the Holy of Holies, but also the crack cocaine epidemic in our communities. We need to be concerned about inspiration, revelation, but also the rate of incarceration of our males and females. So what I'm trying to say, we, we, yes, we're going to do an evangelistic meeting. We're going to do that. The pastor has assigned me. He's given, he's given me my marching orders. However, if you all would permit me, I don't want to call it a crusade. Listen to me, folks. This ain't no crusade. We're not getting ready to do this. is not an evangelistic meeting that we're inviting people to. I need you to get this. What we're doing, this is not a revival for the church. Even though it might include all of those things in terms of attributes, that's not what we call it. If we're going to be fishers of men and women and children in this age, in this culture, in this post-COVID pandemic dynamic, if we're going to be reaching the world for Jesus and taking Bridgeport by a storm, We can't call it, listen to me, we cannot call it an evangelistic meeting. Nobody's going to come. We can't call it a revival. Ain't nobody coming. Listen to me, folk. They're not coming. You can't call it a crusade. Nobody's going to come. Let me tell you what we need to call this. We need to call it a community initiative. That's very significant. This is a community initiative. This is not going to be this. I'm telling you, folks, God's about he's about to perform a miracle in this city. He's getting ready to perform a miracle with this church. You'll see. But it's going to be through a community initiative. And what do you mean, Ron Smith, when you say a community initiative? I'm not just playing with words. I need you to follow me very carefully. This is not a campaign evangelistically. We're not calling it that. This is not a crusade. We're not calling it that. This is not a revival. This is a community initiative. What do you mean? What do you mean a community initiative? It simply means this. The community is sponsoring the system for survival. I don't know if that makes any sense to you so far. If the community can buy into this process by owning it and appreciating what we're doing in the community, they will show up and allow you as a church to host it. So let me say it carefully. System for Survival is is sponsored by the the wide Bridgeport community. Not just Seventh-day Adventists, but by the community. We're training every day at 10 o'clock. We're training a group of Bible workers, Bible counselors. We were here last night. We were exploring. We were charting out, just mapping out our course to start. We're ready, we got our materials, we're ready to roll. And we're going to learn every day between the hours of 10 and 12, six days a week for three consecutive weeks. While we are preaching at night, we're gonna be working during the day. First, we're gonna have a a, a didactic, interactive, 
learning period with Bible counselors, and guess what? They're getting paid. It's a full-time job. So if, if there's anybody in here that's broke, I shouldn't make this announcement at church, should I? If, if, if there's anybody in here so broke, they can't pay attention. I would encourage you. I'll be here for a few moments. I've got to do a wedding in just a couple of hours. So I'm going to have to, have to do it in New York. So I'm going to have to get out of here shortly. So don't think that I'm antisocial. I'm not. I'm going to say, Yolanda, I want you to go to the door with me when it's time. Okay? If you don't mind. And shake hands. And hug the people and let them know who you are. Nod your head and say, okay. Don't ever disobey me in church in front of people like that. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to meet you at the door. We're going to hug you as far as the pastor would let us, like something like that. We'll do a little side something, you know, just to connect with you uh, as a little preamble to, we, to being all over you, like we're going to be for the next three weeks. We want to get to know you. want you to bring people you love. Um, we want the community to sponsor this. And pastor, we're going to lift you up every night because you're hosting it with your board of elders. And the community is going to be proud that when our counselors knock on their doors and they talk about issues like affordable housing and affordable health care, and when they discuss issues surrounding escalating crime and declining morals in our community, we need to get back to God. We need to get back to basics. We need to come together, we're going to say in our community, we need to come together somewhere. We need to find us a spot so we can rally and talk about how we can keep our children safe. Guess what? The pastor is going to open his doors here at Bridgeport Tabernacle. and We're going to stand up every night and we're going to celebrate how kind this church is, how kind this pastor is to allow the community to do their rally here. Isn't that beautiful? That's what I mean when I'm giving the concept of a community initiative. Now, I don't want to say a whole lot more except to say if you are interested in being a Bible counselor, we're meeting every day. Pastor, I might even expand the horizons a little bit to let some others who want to get in the door come. Okay, the pastor has said, now, Ron, he told me, he gave me my marching orders. He says, now, he, he tried to twist that thing. He flipped it up there. Okay, I, don't know. I can never call the pastor a liar in church. I would never do that by God's grace. But he flipped it up there. And he tried to give you the impression that I'm this super altruistic guy. I don't mind sharing. The Southern Union is well endowed. You know, the North American division is the most wealthy division in the world church. Did you know that? The North American division made up of all of us. And the Southern Union is the most wealthy union in the North American division which means it's the money pot of the world church in the South. Well, here's my vision. I'm a Northeastern boy. I came from Northeastern. Okay, I might be the president of the South. I might have eight conferences under my jurisdiction. Who cares? But that's what I'm doing. I might be a shrink. I might be a psychologist, and I am, but who cares? But you need to know that because we're going to be marketing that. I have a vision that we need to come back to our dead areas, areas that are dying more rapidly than others. And here are some outskirt areas that are not really palpitating like other areas of the work. I went to Western New York, and we did a meeting just like this. And the Lord gave us a rich harvest as a result of preaching three weeks. You know what? The Lord put on my mind. He says, Ron, you need to go to Bridgeport, Connecticut. And by the grace of God, you need to foster a deep-seated revitalization and reconnection of God's people in that city. You need to fill up God's church. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do here. I promise you that's what God is getting ready to do. And it's not going to have a lot to do with any kind of elocution from me. It's not about the preacher at all. But it has everything to do with the fact that we are going to join hands together and we're going to make it happen going to have good food. We have a great caterer, and she's wonderful. She fixes vegan food, and she makes it taste like Philistine food. All right, you're going to enjoy it. I'm telling you, folks, you're going to enjoy it. She's going to be feeding the workers during the day. She's going to be feeding all of us on Sabbath. And guess what? Every night, every night, 
Every night that the campaign is in progress, you know what's going to happen? We're going to have a party. We're going to be partying back. Uh, you got a DJ in that, in that, in that uh, dining room, Pastor? Uh, you got a DJ back there? Uh, all right, so we, we're going to be having some good food. We're going to bring people together. And we're just going to, so tell your friends. We're going to be doing some fun stuff here. And God is going to do a marvelous thing to facilitate great, great prayer and great plans and continued incessant intercession and importuning for people who are sick. We're going to have anointing services, and we're going to have baptisms here as well. And let me tell you something, folks. I don't call it, you know, we change the nomenclature. I don't call a, ca a campaign, a crusade, an evangelistic meeting anymore. I call it a community initiative. I don't call baptism, baptism anymore, Pastor. Don't, don't disfellowship me, please. But don't do that, sir. I, I'm going to hang by. I'm going to hang by, okay? But we call baptism, guess what? Pain burying ceremonies. Where people in the community can bury their pain and come alive in Jesus Christ. Don't try to be cute, folks. Come on and say amen. You know that's riveting and it's going to work. And I need all hands on deck. I need all hearts engaged in prayer. And let's hope for the best as we go forward. Now, I did say I'm going to have to get out of here shortly, so I'm going to preach a short sermon. So I don't want you to be alarmed. I'm not going to be long-winded. I just had to give my preamble surrounding the evangelistic meeting. But I want to preach a sermon today entitled, under, under the theme of System for Survival, I'll be preaching on the 31st in the morning to kind of set us, set us up for the opening night. But today, under the auspices of System for Survival, I want to preach a sermon entitled, Unshackled. Unshackled. Who read that text so beautifully? If the Son, therefore, shall make you free. John 8, 36. You shall be free indeed. I better keep this closed, else I'm going to start talking a long time. I want to illustrate that freedom motif in the book of Mark. The Bible says in Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? You son of the most high God, I adjure you by God that you do not torment me. For Jesus said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion. For we are many. Let me hasten on to verse 15. And they come to Jesus. And see him that was possessed with the devil, I'm talking about freedom, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, speaking of Jesus, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. However, Jesus says, no, no. 
But go home to your friends. Get a little text here. And tell them how great things the Lord has done for you. Unshackled. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will take the next few moments and do what I could never do. And that is to reach in the deeper recesses of our processing and our thinking and where we are trapped, where we are emotionally incarcerated, where we are spiritually locked up and bound. We pray today to be free. In Jesus' name, amen. In this, the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, John 8, 36 as well, but particularly this, the fifth chapter of Mark, I find what has got to be one of the most interesting chapters in the entire Bible. Not another chapter like it in the entire Word of God. For in Mark chapter 5, he conveys articulately and clearly and graphically, through illustrations, what it's like to lose your mind. What it's like to be depressed, overcome, pushed back, beaten down, and controlled by elements that you can't contain nor manage. But he also, in the very same chapter, talks about the liberating, dynamic, emancipating power of Jesus Christ. So thus, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we, that's us, who are endeavoring to follow in the footprints of the God-man, Jesus Christ, we find ourselves living in very hostile environments. Would you agree? Talk to me. Would you agree? No, really, we are in a very perilous period of history. Well, if you ever watch CNN, Wolf, Wolf Blitzer said it this way. We're living in an age of crises, conflicts, and confrontations. I say we're living in an age, Elder Joe Davis, we're living in an age where goodness has been gored by the bull of iniquity. We're living in an age where holiness is hated. Truth has been trampled underneath the insensitive feet of men and women. In an age where Christ is cheerfully crucified, his presence is not welcome, nor is it wanted. I've got to add, though, that this is not peculiar to the 21st century Christian. But if I read my Bible right, even though I'm reading it on my iPhone, some say that's a sin. I didn't bring my Bible. I'll bring it next time. If I read my Bible right or understand it correctly, I understand that's always the case. It's always been so. In other words, Christ has always been hated. He's often been alienated and ostracized and excommunicated from society. Well, such is the case in this story of these demoniacs of Gadara that we just read about. You know, Mark talks about one man. But when you read the other synoptic gospels, preacher, you preacher, you praying preacher, you, when we read the other synoptic gospels, they talk about more than one demon-possessed man. So is there really a conflict? No, it's just the eyewitness perspective of each writer. But I think Mark, in order to convey to us the enormity or the magnitude of this man's problem, he zeroes in on one man. I want you to picture the story in your mind's eye. Jesus has been teaching and preaching by the seaside and now being mentally and emotionally exhausted and physically exhausted, he beseeches his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. Well, let me say to us, 
I'm looking around, and I know this is a transitional period. We're transitioning from our worship uh, starting at um, 12 for the last five months and beginning at 11 now. So it's, it's going to take a little time to catch up post-COVID. I get it. But Jesus, you know, probably finishing up a camp meeting, he admonished his disciples, so let's cross over to the other side. Let me say to you, fi figuratively, let's cross over to the other side. Let's cross on over the truth. Let's cross on over to holiness. Let's cross over to a higher level of commitment. Let's cross over because it's evening time. Let's cross over to the other side. Well, there to meet him on the other side was a man whose dilemma was serious. He was disowned by his people. He was living in a cemetery and not the least of his problems. He was possessed with demons. Are y'all listening to me? He was possessed with demons. Here he is. I've endeavored to look at this man in preparation for this morning. Guess what? His peer group condemns him. He's forced to live in a cemetery and he's possessed with demons. Now, the tragedy is, I understand that graveyards are designed for dead folks and not the living. But his home is a tomb. His companions are the skeletal fragments of those who sleep in the dust. Somebody has said, this man was not only emotionally emulsified and mentally mortified, but he was also spiritually strangulized. He was dead. A spiritually dead demoniac. And it highlights the fact, my brothers and my sisters, that either we're going to be directed by God or driven by the devil. Either we're going to be influenced by Jesus or infested by the devil. Either we're going to be sanctified by a Holy Spirit or desecrated by an evil spirit. There is no middle ground of neutrality. There is is no straddling the fence when it comes to spiritual things. I wonder, though, I wonder, as I read this thing, I wonder, what is it that caused this man to live in such a condition, like many of us? Maybe he just couldn't cope. Maybe he couldn't cope with the problems that he faced. Or perhaps he couldn't bear his burdens in the heat of the day. Or perhaps he just couldn't stand up under the pressures the pressures, young people, of staying in school. The pressures of finding suitable employment. The pressures of being a social outcast. The pressures of seeing the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. The pressures, or perhaps, I don't know, his sins pushed him further and further to a point of no extrication. I don't know what the issues were. But Ellen White makes an observation, if I read her carefully. One day this man took a step. He was leading a normal life at first. But then he took a step. And the devil took control of his mind. Somebody has said the world could see the scars on the outside. But nobody could really see the wounds on the inside. Here he is. He lives in a cemetery. Now let me suggest something, folks. Spiritually, whenever a person turns his or her back on God, there's but one place for that person to exist. Hear me? And that's in the tombs of iniquity. It really doesn't matter how intelligent we might think we are. You may have been on the dean's list every semester in college. But without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. Your home might look like the Taj Mahal. But without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. You may dress in all the finest of clothes and all the silks and satins, but without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. There's but one place for a man or a woman who retreats from God and reality, and that is to exist in the tombs of iniquity, the tombstones of irrationality, 
Mark says this man is so miserable with himself, he's so uncomfortable with who he is, that he begins to take sharp rocks and he lacerates his flesh. And he pulls his hair out by the roots. And he cries and he howls and he moans all night long. He's miserable. You know, the Bible says it this way. You know, the wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. Watch this, folk. Friday night in Bridgeport. I don't live here, but I, ha I just have a hunch because I'm from Brooklyn originally. Guess what? Friday nights, the clubs are packed. Huh? Running from man to man and woman to woman, sucking on the bottle. Trying to get high. Trying to find some peace. Trying to find some escape. You know something, ladies and gentlemen? What a message we have to share with this community. Peace doesn't come in a bottle. But it comes in the body of Christ. Peace doesn't come in a pill. But it comes in a person. Peace doesn't come in a sexual encounter. But it comes in a savior. And his name is Jesus. Mark says this man is so miserable that he, that he takes sharp rocks. And he just lacerates his flesh. And he cries and he howls and he moans. Early in the morning... You could hear him whimpering softly. Late in the evening, you could hear him crying loudly. He's restless. He's restless. But also, he's hurting himself. You know, we are surrounded by people in our community who are hurting themselves. We got to set them free. We got to do something about that. They're on a slippery slope to perdition. They're dying. And they're hurting themselves. You don't believe me, folks? Ask the young man whose liver was bloated because of liquor, whose heart is failing, you know, because of Ciroc and old English. You know, some folks still deal with that. In Colt 45, some folks still do that. His liver is bloated, his heart is failing. He's hurting himself. Ask the young man who's overdosed with a crack pipe or a needle stuck in his arm he'll tell you he's only succeeded in hurting himself ask the woman who walks the streets by night selling her wares in order to give bread to her children if she's clear she will tell you she's hurting herself uh oh Ask the man, ask the woman who quietly delved into immorality. Nobody knows but them and God. But at the end of the day, if they could tell you, you know what they would tell you? They've only succeeded in hurting themselves. I'm serious, folk, but what is this man really asking? As he howls, as he moans, as he cries, even though it seems that he's out of his mind, what is he really asking? You know what he's asking? He's asking, does anybody care? Is anybody interested in what I'm going through? And guess what? We're living in an age. This is hot off the press. This is hot off the sociological press. Did you know that at the end of the year 2018, which really represent the latest statistics we have for any social workers in here, the latest statistics we have, child suicide, young people taking their lives, reached an all-time high at the end of the year 2018 the latest real stat that we have in other words more young people are taking their lives now in protest in protest wondering does anybody care does anybody care where i go does anybody care what i listen to anybody care what i wear whether my pants are all the way down to here or whether they're up here does anybody care when I take some time with some young men and tell them to pull up their pants, they roll their eyes at me at first. But when I tell them the genesis of where I came from, they pull their pants up to here. But somebody cared. And that's the question that young people are asking now. Does anybody care? And you know something? I'm very serious, ladies and gentlemen. I am passionate about this. You know something? I'm not talking to the brick and the mortar when I say the church. I'm talking about you and me. We've got to give an answer. We have to. It's time.
We've got to go out where the rubber meets the road. We got to find that junkie. I'm serious. We got to get off our high horse horses. We got to find that junkie and offer him a new high in Jesus Christ. I'm serious. We got to find that drunk and offer him a drink that won't make him drunk. But he'll be drinking from the crystal fountain that shall never run dry. This man is crying and howling. Somebody help me. Somebody help me. Help. Help. If we could listen with a spiritual attuning to God's voice. And the voice of those around us. If we could see with the eyes of Jesus what Jesus sees. We would hear the cry. We would see the cry. We would see the pleading eyes. Help. Jesus hears that cry as he's making his way across the shore. Somebody says, someone sent out an SOS. You know, Jesus, Jesus has a divine antenna that picks up distress signals. Somebody was in need. Somebody was calling on the name of Jesus. Well, there to meet him, there to meet him on the other side was a man. Watch this. The disciples and Jesus are in the boat. Get the picture. There to meet him on the other side when they stepped foot on that shore. There to meet him was a man whose dilemma was serious. He was disowned by his people. Listen to me. He was living in a graveyard. There he was. And the disciples, as they got closer to him to see what was going on, they took a look. Ellen White says their blood curdled and, 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 and froze within their veins. You got to see him. As they look at the man, he's stark naked. He's foaming at the mouth. His eyes look like two coals of fire from the burning hell itself. He's screaming and hollering. He's jumping up and down. And the disciples take one look at him. Their blood freezes in their veins. And they leave Jesus standing there all by himself. Oh, ladies and gentlemen of the living God. Children of the living God. How easily. Listen to me. How easily we forget. I'm talking to you directly now. How easily you forget how Jesus has helped you in your last crisis. Listen to me. Why, Mark 4 now. Just coming over the lake the night before. See how easily we forget. Just coming over the lake the night before. You know the story in Mark 4. The winds became a little unruly. And the lightning had begun to write a flaming message of descent in the sky. And the thunder was muttering against the horizon in protest. The disciples sang that song. Carest thou not that we perish? I think of James Cleveland. Carest thou not that we perish? On the heels of that, you know the story. Jesus stood up, told the winds to shut up. And the waves to be still. That same hand that calmed the storm. The same hand that stemmed the tide. The same hand that quieted the elements was held up against these raging demons. About 2,000 demons, Ellen White says, in this one man. About 2,000 demons in this one man. Bible looks at it as a garrison. 2,000 demons in one man. Can you imagine that? Makes you wonder how many demons folk have in them in church. One demon can wreak havoc and rip up this church. Imagine 2,000 demons being in one man. And he comes to Jesus, falls at his feet. He says, don't torment me. Leave me alone. Jesus looked at him and said, come out of the man. Thou unclean spirit. Well, you know, folk, that was very, very, a very, a very powerful expression. These demons had a sense of recall. Listen to me. These demons, they recognized this Jesus as the one who kicked them out of heaven in the first place. You know, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been beaten up before? Don't answer out loud. Don't do it. I'll do it for you. I have. I've been beaten up before. It's embarrassing. You know, run your mouth. I picked the fight. I'm the one who started it. And they got beat up in front of a whole lot of people. That's it. Don't be laughing at me. I see some of y'all laughing right now. That's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I remember I was, I was in the seventh grade. There was a little Asian fella sitting next to me. You know, I grew up in the hood. 
this little Asian fellow sitting next to me. I was tall and lanky. I played ball. I didn't like the way he looked. He had slanted eyes. He had straight hair. He got A's on his exams and social studies. I got D's. I hated him. I shouldn't say that. I just didn't like him. I didn't like him. So I took my pencil eraser and I began poking him in his side. And he looked at me very calmly and he says, Ouch. That hurts. Please stop. I said, I don't want to stop. You know, hood rat. I'm a hood rat. I don't want to stop. Shut up, boy. Teacher turned around. He says, Ronald, pick up your pencil and get your work done. And leave Choi alone. As soon as the teacher turned his back, I started again. I took my pencil eraser. I wanted to take the point, but I didn't want to make him bleed. So I, I, poke, I poke my pencil eraser at his side. He says, ouch, let's be friends. I don't want to fight. I said, I want to fight. He says, let's be friends. I said, I don't want to be friends. The bell tolled. What have I done to you? I said, I just don't like you want to be your friend what have I done I said I'm gonna get you let's fight come on let's go outside well we didn't have we didn't have Twitter we didn't have text and stuff back then really folks because I'm really old so y'all don't know how old I am I'm really old I'm as old as Methuselah I just got dye in my hair so I try to look young only because I was trying to impress you today that's it don't be laughing at me folk I use just for men but I've been around. And back then, they didn't have text. The dinosaur age, they didn't have text back then. But somehow, the word just got around. There's going to be some action at the flagpole. Ron going to throw down with joy. Y'all going to be there? Man, the place was packed. I got out there. It was like the WWF. The crowds were there. Choi's trying to get away. <laughs> stop. And I'm pushing. Stop. I said, I don't want to stop. I said, come on, boy. Let's go at it. Crowd was there. They were like, let's get it on. Let's get it on. I said, come on, man. Let's go at it. Let's go at it. And I lunged at him. And the last thing I remember, serious, he did something like this. And he kicked me down to the concrete. My head hit the cold ground. I looked up. Guess what? Guess what? I'm very serious, though. I looked up. Preacher, I looked up. And the heavens opened. I saw the Big Dipper. And the Little Dipper and all the heavenly constellations. There was a hush over the ground. They couldn't believe it. This tall, athletic-looking Ron Smith. Gun... Don't get knocked down by a little short, sawed-off joy. They can't believe it. There's a hush over the crowd. They're giggling. First, they were cheering for me. Then they were cheering for joy. Go, joy. Go, joy. I'm, I'm laying there, and I see the dude. His face is coming closer to me. I jumped up real fast. I said, I ain't going out like this. And I lunged at him again, and he went, ha! He kicked me back down to the concrete again. And then when my head hit the ground this time, Pastor, Elder Davis, Pastor, don't talk to Seti when I'm preaching. Don't do that. Pastor, I saw some of the most beautiful colors. Some of the most beautiful colors I saw. And then I jumped up one more time. I said, oh, no. I'm not going out like this. So I lunged at him again. As I lunged at him again, this time he did something strange. He had his shirt off. His hair was all over his head. And he was, he was making some strange noises like that. <laughs> kind of reminded me of a guy named Bruce Lee. And this time he almost decapitated me. He kicked my head against the flagpole. He jumped up in the air, spun around, and kicked my head against the flagpole. My head hit the flagpole. And then it hit the ground. Blood's pouring out of my nose, all over my collar. And then he took his little hanky, he leaned down, and he says, Are you okay? <laughs> okay, he picked me up, walked me to the washroom, wiped the blood off my collar, off my face. Of course, when I went home, my parents asked me, What in the world happened to you? 
I said, I was cutting up, man. I tell you, we were running, and I fell about four or five times. I was too embarrassed to tell them what really happened to me. The crowd, they were cheering for joy. And when I got in front of the crowd, my dignity, I had to find a way to recapture it. So I remember I, I went by, and I said, man, we ought to hook up, man, you know. And the crowd, and the crowd was saying, I can't leave my brother hanging like that. And the crowd, and the crowd says, look at Ron cheesing up now. That little joy beat him up. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Many, many years later, I'm going to tell you this story during the campaign, during the initiative. I'm going to tell you the story then. Many years later, I was in the seventh grade. Then I was a young fellow. Benjamin Schlesinger School, at IS-72, there in Queens. It's called something else now. It might, be called, it might be called Count Basie School now. But anyway, it was a school there in Brooklyn, right there. In Queens, pardon me. That's where I got beaten up. Every time I drive past Guy Brewer Boulevard and look at that flagpole, I have a sense of recall. And you know, while I'm, as an adult, I, you know, at age 42, many years ago, that was many, many years ago, at least 20 some years ago, I had a stroke. Right at the height of my game, I was pastoring the Ephesus Church in Harlem. I'll tell you some stories later. I had a stroke. And there I lay in the hospital, unable to walk, unable to talk. Not because any of the lifestyle things, it's just something, something happened, an injury-induced stroke. And there were a team of doctors there, and they were, you know, like a, it was a teaching hospital. It was called, um, it was a university teaching hospital, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. So there were a group of doctors around my bed. They were probably looking at my case carefully and teaching and instructing. And there was one young doctor there that I remember. He wasn't that young, but he was young enough. He was sitting there, and I looked on his white coat, ethoscope around his neck. Guess what it said? Dr. Choi. And I said to myself, no, I can't be him. Of course, I couldn't really talk properly. He says, hey, Ron, Ron Smith, how are you? Then he says, you remember me? And of course, even when I'm in my, on my bed of affliction, my ego was still rampant. I said, it's just not ringing a bell. He said, I'll cut it out. She said, he says, do you still have that left hook? I said, oh, no, Dr. Joy. I said, no, I remember. I said, no, I'm not a fighter anymore. I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter. He says, hey, man, we're going to get you up out of, the, out of the front door. And I want you to know that that doctor stuck with me. The doctor said I would never, ever walk again. You didn't see me come in here on a walker, did you? But I want to tell you something, Vogue. Every time I looked at that doctor, I had a sense of recall. And he's my friend. These demons, watch this. These demons in human form, they looked at Jesus. And they said, this is the same being who kicked us out of heaven in the first place. And if demons recognize who Jesus is, then everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Come out of the man. Thou unclean spirit. Where's Zane? I gotta, where's Zane? I need him to help me wrap this thing up. I got to train musicians. Never leave the preacher by himself. I need Zane near me right now because I'm trying to wrap this sermon up. And if nobody, anybody knows where Zane is, grab him. Where's Zane? Look at Zane. What's up, Zane? Zane, Zane, Zane. Give me some skin, man. All right. Thank you. Zane, just play anything the Lord puts on your heart as I try to close the sermon. Um, but let me say something, folks. This Jesus, who these demons were familiar with, he exercised their presence out. And he drove them into some pigs, about 2,000 of them. And the Bible says they drowned and they choked in the sea, about 2,000. And watch this. We read it. Those who fed the swine. Those who were accustomed to watching the stock market, that was the economy of that day, the swine. Those who watched the Dow Jones Industrial Average reaching an all-time low. Those who watched the NASDAQ of their day fall because of all of those swine that committed suicide. What is this? What happened? They asked Jesus, you killed our economy. Get out of here. We read it. They invited Jesus to depart from their coasts. 
So as Jesus is about to leave, this man is sitting away from the tombs now, neatly shaven now, his hair combed now, he's lucid now, he's cognizant of stuff now. Master, can I get back in the boat with you? Let me go with you. Please don't leave me by myself. I'm scared. You gave me my life back. My stuff was a mess. I was messed up. I was out of my mind. I lost my family. I lost my job. I lost my health. I lost my reputation. I lost my dignity. I lost my church membership. We got some people to find. We got to find some people that were once with us, aren't with us anymore. We got to find them. Telling you, we got to reconnect. In this community initiative, we got to reconnect. I've lost stuff, Jesus. I need to get back in the boat. Let me go. Let me go with you, Jesus. Please. No. Don't you get in this boat. Why? Why, Jesus? Let me go. You can't go. Why? I need you to go back to your community. Go back to your hood. Go back to your church. Go back to your surrounding periphery, whatever it is. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell people what happened to you. Tell them how you were messed up. How you were toe up from the floor up. Tell them how you lost everything. And I gave you your life back. Tell them. Yes, sir. Can you see him? As he's escorted down the dusty roads of downtown Decapolis. People are asking, sir, what happened to you? What happened to you? Well, I don't know. Except, I met a man named Jesus. What does that mean? I don't know. All I know is I gave him my sorrows. And he gave me his joys. I gave him my nightmares. And he gave me, he gave me his dreams. I gave him my life. And he made me a brand new creature. All I can say is that I'm free. I'm unshackled. I was bound and he let me loose. Let me ask you. Would you be free? I'm talking to you very up close now. Because you all are dealing with some stuff. I know, folk. I know what stuff is. I can't be hoodwinked. People suffer. I survived that stroke. I've survived cancer twice. Don't tell me God can't fix stuff. He can fix it. And you know something? When he fixes it, he makes you brand new. Better than you were before. Can you see him as he's escorted? People are asking, what happened to you? People are going to ask you, what happened to you? So today, when I ask you that question, would you be free? Think about where you are. Emotionally. Think about where you are financially. Think about where you are in your health. Think about where you are in relationship to your children, to your parents, to your sibling. Think about where you are in relationship to your boss. Think about where you are in relationship to employment. Think about where you are and where you want to be or where you were. And evaluate today. Do you need to be set free? Do you need that healing touch? Do you need that unshackling energy? Do you need to be unleashed and released and fostered into sweeter horizons? Is that what you need? I'm going to make an appeal. Because I'm not going to leave here. I can't leave here. I can't go and do my cousin's wedding like I'm getting ready to do right now in Yonkers, New York. I can't do that until I give you an opportunity to be free. You know why? Because I know you're hurting. I'm looking at some of you right now. You're hurting. I see the pain. I see the pain in some of your eyes. I'm not going to call you out, but I see it. You know why? We people, we all got problems. There's some sick people here. This is an age where we have something called HIPAA laws. We don't have to disclose the, specif the specificity of our disorders. I'm going to tell you something about mine in this campaign. In this initiative but today 
somebody is struggling. I don't know what it is. It might be diabetes. It might be heart disease. I don't know. It might be elevated cholesterol. I have no idea. Maybe you've got a sick relative, a sick child. I don't know. A sick parent. Maybe you're sick yourself. Can't talk about it. But I need the healing touch of liberation. I need it now. And as Zane plays softly, I'm serious. Get up out of your seat and come on down here. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to move. If you can just move this out of the way from me, I'm going to make room for somebody to come down to be free. I'm going to ask you now, if you want me to pray for you, just step out. Step out and come on down here. Just come down. It's okay. Don't look around to see who's watching you. None of that matters right now. Because we're about to get set free from some stuff that we're suffering with. And I invite you to come. I invite you to come. You know, if Jesus could heal a leper, just come on in. I'm going to give you plenty of room here. Because people are going to be coming. Just come on in. Just come on in. Press on in. If Jesus could heal lepers, if he could heal all manner of malignancy of his day, leprosy. That was a scourge of that day. You know that? That was worse than AIDS. Your, your flesh rots off, rots off, your limbs fall off. It's horrible. It's terrible. He healed stuff like that. He can heal cancer. I'm telling you, folks, I'm a living witness. He can heal you from a stroke. I, he can. He can fix that. He can heal you. A Syrophoenician woman got healed. A man sitting by a gate got healed. A man sitting by a pool of Bethesda for 38 years, he got healed because of the touch of the master. Today, you're going to get that. You're not going to be the same when you go home. I don't care what the prognosis or diagnosis is. Listen to me. I've heard diagnoses. I've heard prognoses, and nothing was happening. Medication wasn't working anymore. But God set me free. He can do it. He's going to set you free. I promise you. Guess what? The wheels are going to start turning today, today, today. My second appeal surrounds your business and finance. You know, stuff that you ain't going to talk to nobody about. Unmanageable credit card debt. Unmanageable credit card debt. Mortgages that are about to foreclose, eviction notices, repos, you know, stuff that happens to people who are broke and are having hard times. Needing a job, don't have one. About to lose your job. God says, I'm getting ready to, I'm getting ready to reverse your ill fortune. I'm getting ready to turn that thing around. I'm going to do it today. Something special is getting ready to happen. Something special is about to happen. You know something? On Monday morning, you're going to open your mailbox. Something's going to happen. God's getting ready to blow your mind with something. I don't know how, when, what, where, to what degree, but something's getting ready to bust wide open for you. You've got to trust God on that. There might be some relationship challenges here. I invite you to step up. Mother to child, child to mother, father to child, child to father. The marriage, the joy is gone. No more sweetness needs to be fixed. A strained relationship in the workplace, on the playground, in the house of God. God fixes those too. And then there's a fourth category. You can come on out if you want the touch. You're going to get it. The fourth category. I call it strongholds. Hard to break habits. Hard to break situations. You know, like addictions. Know what I mean? Stuff that just traps you. Overeating. You know, some stuff that just won't leave you alone. Relationships that are not authorized by God. Stuff, you know, earthly human stuff that you just need to break free from. God is going to set you free. That's where the text comes in. 
If the Son, therefore, will make you free, you'll be free indeed. So I want to pray for you right now. May I? Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, your people have come. Some people have come, O oh Lord, with medical challenges, health, health difficulties, in pain. Body stopped responding to medications. Lipid panel has returned and has showed all type of elevated levels. A1C is disclosed. You're pre-diabetic or diabetic. Or maybe somebody's in the throes of type 2 or juvenile diabetes of some sort. And they need to be fixed. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, whatever the malady is, Lord, you are above hematology. You're above oncology. You're above neurological difficulties. Oh God, stretch your hand right now and touch your child who suffers. You know what it is, Lord. The specificity right now, Lord, of your laser vision is targeted to your child who's burdened with an illness of some genre, of some dimension, Lord. You can fix it. Dementia. ALS. Upper respiratory challenges. COPD. Neurological challenges. Epilepsy. Lupus, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. Oh God, you can fix asthma. You know, there are a lot of diseases, Lord, from Dan to Beersheba, from A to Z. Oh God, you, you are scanning the horizon of your people here today, and you're looking upon us, and Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, the same hand that touched the woman with the issue of blood. The same hand that healed a paralytic. The same hand that healed a man who was let down through the roof. The same, the same hand that gave Bontimaeus his sight back. The same hand that raised Jairus' daughter. Fix, I beg, somebody's health challenge. Right now, please, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, touch, fix, heal, set free. In the name of Jesus. Lord, there's some financial woes going on right now. It's not my business, but Lord, somebody's about to get a gigantic blockbuster breakthrough from heaven. You're about to rain something down on somebody because you know why? Lord, because they trust you. They trust you enough to come to this altar and ask. We're vulnerable. We're pleading. We're figuratively by faith on our knees. Fix our funds. Fix our employment. Fix our housing. Fix our transportation. Fix our food. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, I pray it's not my business, but it's your business. We need you to help somebody right now who's in trouble, who cannot talk about it. But Lord, they're going to see very shortly what just happened. They're going to see it. They're going to experience it. Do it, Lord. Do it for us, Lord. And then, Lord, I pray for some relationship that's strained, that we felt there was no hope for reconciliation, no hope for reestablishment, no hope for any more intimacy, no more hope. Oh, God, fix that relationship, whether it's on the marital frontier, if it's on a friendship frontier, if it's on a church membership frontier, on the playground, in the schoolhouse, in the church house, in the workplace. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, fix relationships. And then, Lord, I pray for somebody who's battling with a stronghold. An addiction. I don't know. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's crack. Can't talk about it because we are, we are polished Seventh-day Adventist Christians in profile. But we are broken down inside. We are rotten deep down inside. 
And we ask, oh God, that you will reach, reach into the very recesses of our souls, into the, into the very bowels of our existences, and find the stuff that, that pins us to the mat, the stuff that quarantines us from joy, the stuff, that, the stuff that separates us and barricades us from grace. We call them addictions. We call them strongholds. My prayer right now, oh God, is that you will break every chain. Do what I ask. We brought our sick. We brought our financially and business embattled. We brought our relationships. We brought our strongholds. And now, Lord, you told us, cast your care upon me, for I care for you. You told us, you promised that if we come to you, you would in no wise cast us out. You promised. That the thoughts, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, that I have for you are thoughts of peace, not of evil, with a bright and a hopeful future. You promised if my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn and turn and turn from their wicked ways you promised that you would hear from heaven that you would forgive our sins and you would heal our land here we are here we are right now lord here we are here we are there's nothing about us this good but here we are and we beg you our faith takes hold of you our unshakable trust is anchored in you do it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your hands together for Jesus Christ right now. He's done it. He's done it for now. Now, I want you to lift your hand right now and, and, and repeat after me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It is done. In Jesus' name. I tell you to hug somebody, but stay safe. Go back to your seats right now. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you on the 